Eddie Trunk here, Trunk Nation on Volume Series XM 106, talking rock with you every day. It is great to talk some rock for a few minutes here with a guy that I just had a chance to see, along with his band Mastodon, who were a late addition to Rocklahoma a couple weeks ago, which I hosted, and then saw these guys do their thing, and then ran into uh, Ron and Troy from Mastodon at the bar at the Hard Rock. We had a good night, had some fun, had a couple of beers, shared some stories. And then they told me they had a new record coming out, and now the record is officially released, and it is coming out in October. And joining us now from Mastodon is bassist and co-lead vocalist Troy Sanders. Good to see you, man. How are you? I'm great, man. It's good to see you twice in a week. <laughs> exactly. My pleasure. Yeah, we say <laughs> see because we're also doing this on Zoom, so people will be able to watch this on the SiriusXM app in order, in addition to, of course, listening to it. So. You know, I was telling you, man, like you, I was telling the audience, you were a late addition on that festival because obviously things are so crazy out there with touring. Has that popped up and happened to you guys a lot? Were you ready and prepared to jump out and do a show? Yeah, um, we were originally scheduled to play Bonnaroo two days prior to the Rocklahoma, where I saw you a couple weeks ago. Bonnaroo got canceled like the day before because of heavy rains from uh, the Hurricane Ida remnants that was coming through Tennessee. So we were super bummed out when Bonnaroo canceled. Hours later, Rocklahoma called, seeing if we could fill in a slot. So, you know, one door closed, another one opened, and we were, we, it was just logistics. Can we get the crew to, and our gear to Oklahoma in 24 hours? So it was great, man. It was an awesome venue. I've followed Rocklahoma for 15 years. I've seen all the bands that have come through those stages there in prior Oklahoma. It was cool to be there. Yeah, and for you guys, I guess it worked out. I mean, it sucked the other one was canceled, but at least you were rehearsed, right? Because you were planning on doing the set there anyway. So you were tuned up because it sounded great. Cool, thanks. Yeah, we were rehearsed. Um, it was just about, you know, getting back on the horse. And uh, and uh, it was just cool to, that we were on the radar because uh, it was Phil Anselmo who I had to cancel last minute because his property was apparently beat up by uh, all the floods. So it was right. sad that he had to cancel, but, you know, an opportunity for us, so... We were rehearsed. It was just a matter of just getting there. And it's low pressure, too, Eddie, because when you show up, only a handful full of people know that you're going to be there. Uh, so maybe some <laughs> core fans are aware of it, but it's a low pressure gig. You know, it's just like, hey, here's our rock and roll party with us. And if you don't like it, that's OK. And if you're brand new to us and you, and you dig it, then, then it's nice to meet you. And we've got a new fan. Yeah. And I'm going to say this, too. And I'm not just saying this because you're on the air with me. I taught because I'm very connected to that festival. I've hosted it every year since it happened. And you, there were a lot of people that did come up to me, not only very excited, your, your people that know the band and love the band that you were added, but a lot of people who did see you for the first time at that, which really, if you think about it, is the whole beauty of playing festivals. Sure, you want to be in front of these big crowds, but you're always you always have that opportunity to convert somebody or turn somebody on to what you're doing. It is the beauty of it, man, is um, is uh, you're not just playing to the, the 12 or 100 people that just like you and come out to see you when you have those opportunities to get in front of fresh faces and be an opener for it on a bigger tour, et cetera. It just allows you to keep growing and um, and 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 not become just, um, you know, too, too one dimensional as far as your fan base, because we want to have people grow with us. Well, speaking of growth. Hushed and Grim is the new album from Mastodon coming out on October 29th. And it just seems like with each record, man, you guys continue to take these leaps and this growth. Tell me a little bit about making this record, which is about, if my math is right, around three, four years in the making since the previous record, right? It is. Our previous record, Emperor of Sand, came out in 2017. So this new one comes out next month. So that's uh, about four and a half years. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, we did a Why solid the delay. Well, we did. A, thankfully, we were on our standard cycle of two and a half years of touring. Towards the end of that two and a half years is when everything got wiped down or wiped away and shut down. So um, we were kind of excited because we had a whole bunch of new riffs and ideas that we were excited to uh, to, to get into our band space and, and start exploring. So it didn't bum us out terribly, uh, too terribly once uh COVID wiped away all of our tour plans for 2020 because we were able to get back in the studio and, and, and that's, what's a healthy cycle for us. And it's been very fortunate, you know, like the two, two and a half years on you're on the road playing all your songs. It gets great around the two year mark. You're excited to start diving into some new stuff. You go in there and you, you write for a year, whatever it may be record. And then once all that's done, you're excited to get back out on the road for a couple of years. So it's been a great balance in our past 21 years, but, uh, 
we started recording this record in October of last year. So we're almost a year from when we started it, but we took our time and we wrapped up around February, um, which was a beautiful thing because we had all year to, to work on it. And even though the rest of the world was having uh, a lot more difficult time than we were personally, we were fortunate enough to have a band rehearsal facility in Atlanta where the four of us were comfortable going and being around each other all the time. So we basically got together roughly every other week for the whole year. And um, it was nice to, to, to witness everyone contributing so much music to this record that when it came time to say, you know, we're like, well, hey, we need to pump the brakes a little bit. We have too much material, which is a great issue to have. Um, that's what ultimately led up to the idea of, of a double album is because we had so much material that we were digging in on and really enjoying. Um, kind of a long winded answer there, Eddie, but. Uh, no, was... no, but, 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 you know, I'm, I'm, I'm smiling because, and we talked about this when we saw each other a little bit in the, in this world we're in now where everybody tells you like people only want a single or let's do an EP or people don't have attention spans for beyond 30 seconds. Uh, I referenced this Iron Maiden's new album is their is their second double studio record of new material in a row. And here you guys are doing a double studio record. So, you know, I think that's one of the great things about the Mastodon fan base. And you can speak to this obviously way more accurately, but they're along for the ride. Like you guys are in, you guys are in a, a unique position. I think that very few bands have where you have a, you have a big enough loyal rabid fan base for what you do that you can get, you can say, yeah, here's a double studio record of all new material and they're going to be all in. They're not going to be like, Oh my God, what do I do with this? They're going to be all in. So that's a, that's a really nice position to be in. And that's something I think you built through the beginning of the band. It seems like doing things on your terms, the way the band wants to do it, not caving to what's happening out there commercially. Yeah, I agree, man. And lucky to have uh, three other bandmates that feel the same way. It's, you know, our art, like a lot of art stems kind of from a selfish place. You know, we just want to love it. And if we love it, we hope that it can, can transcend other people. And, and over the years it has, and our fan base has just continued to grow and our fans are awesome. And what we were saying about continuing to get more fans as we go along, it's, it's pretty incredible, but uh, we've always taken chances. You know, our first big record was 2004 we, Leviathan record. It was, you know, it was based on the story of Moby Dick and in the world of heavy metal, that could have been a, you know, a shot to the foot, you know, a, a career killer, but uh, that really put us on the map. And then we kind of went from there, but um, I guess growing up the way the four of us in the band did in the seventies and eighties and, 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 and we still hold the value of, uh, of the art of the album is brutally important to us. And we're not going to cave into like, what you guys just want one or two songs every few months or whatever that mindset could be. I don't think we could really wrap our head around it. So we're just ingrained to write, write a collection of music that hopefully takes us and the listener on a journey from song one, you know, to the, to the last note of the song. That's, I don't think the four of us could really do it any other way. Do you remember Troy, like for you growing up as a kid, whether it was a concept record or any record in general that really first pulled you in like that, that you just the whole experience of taking off the cellophane, looking at the packaging, flipping through the booklet, going from start to finish, going on that journey from track one to the last track. Do you remember a record or two that had major impact on you like that? Oh yeah. That, that was a big deal, man. Sitting on the floor, every liner note, that's when it became uh, evident to me that, that all ask, you know, you can't write a great record or I couldn't be a part of it. If, if, if the guys were what I considered a great record and then we just phone in the artwork or don't worry about the lyrical content or the behind the scenes credit and liner notes, like all that makes the great package to me. So that was every album to me um, because I had to work and do all my chores and mow the grass to get my money. And that money was hard earned and I spent it on albums and, each and every one, it was it was a deal. You sit down and you pay attention to that yeah. thing. So every album, you know, the first, I don't know, the, all my first albums affected me that way. What was your first record? What was the first real record you remember getting as a kid? I purchased Minute Work, Business as Usual. Ah, oh, yeah. Huge that, record. That would have put me at about 10 years old. They were the biggest band in the world. And, and uh, that was my first album and my first concert. And uh, to this very day, I still keep in touch with Colin Hay, who I've befriended. And it's kind of a full Is circle. Is that right? Yeah, he's a fantastic human being. And it's how'd it you meet me, him? I uh, reached out to him a few years ago because I wanted to cover one of his songs. And uh, he was aware of our band, which blew me away. 
and wound up meeting him, arranged a meeting when he came through Atlanta a few years ago. And we just sat down, swapped ideas. And, and he, his, one of his quotes to me was, was beautiful when we were talking about potentially collaborating. And he said, if your band has the enthusiasm, then I'm interested in collaborating. He's like, I want to play with people that are enthusiastic. And uh, that was very true, but uh, it just struck me as, wow, he's the, 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 you know, the, the fire in his belly is yet to be extinguished as well. Kind of the way I feel about me and my bandmates. You can see it in his eyes when he plays and you can hear it in his, in his soul. And uh, so it's cool to me to every time we speak to, it's like a very um, rewarding feeling because it's just like a full circle of, you know, you were my first album, my first concert. Now we're both men and we've befriended one another and have a lot of respect for each other. It's pretty great. And I may have missed it, but did you ever do the recording? We are working on something now. And for me really? personally, when it, when it happens, it's going to be, uh, you know, easily one of, one of the, in my eyes, it's going to be the, one of the best things I could possibly ever do. So yeah. would this be a, would this be a Colin Hay with Mastodon or a Colin Hay with Troy Sanders? And would it be an original or a cover? We're kind of hashing through that, man. Um, trying to find the right time because we're busy. He's super busy. And uh, as any collaboration, collaboration or super group would go, it's just hard to, to find the time on the calendar, but we've tossed ideas back and forth. Um, he's got some tunes that I've wanted to cover forever that we're starting to demo uh, before we get back on the road. So it would be a Mastodon thing if, if I could choose it. And uh, my guys are open to all types of music. You know, we're not just pigeonholed as, as a heavy metal band only. We, we have many uh, musical inspirations across the board. Wow, that's awesome, man. That <laughs> album, Business, Business as Usual, was a massive record for people that don't know. I worked in a record store and that record was out. We used to sell it by the box, man. We didn't even, we didn't even have time to price them and put them in the shelves. We just ripped the box open and hand them out like hotcakes. It was a There was a few bands around that time. Like Duran Duran was like yep. that, I remember. I mean, there were certain bands like that that were just massive following. So that's, that's really interesting. What was your first heavy rock record? Uh, that would have been, um, let's see, uh, heavy rock record. Well, it turned into Billy Idol and then Joan Jett and then my older brother, Kyle Sanders. He was like, here, check all this out. And then I got the onslaught of Judas Priest, Iron Maiden, Kiss, and then Metallica. And that's when my world completely changed. I closed the bedroom door, picked up his bass guitar and tried to learn every Metallica song I could. And that was my bass lesson. You know, learn all these Metallica records for the next two years. Um, so. <laughs> And Crash then, Course and, then, and Cliff Burton. <laughs> yeah. And then my, my blinders were on and all I wanted to do was, uh, you know, be in a band. But I couldn't do that until I got my driver's license. So I was I joined my first band the day I got my driver's license so I could drive to someone's house and jam. So but it sounds like given your age bracket that it was you were very much a child of, of MTV when you're referencing men at work and all that stuff. I'm sure MTV had a huge mark on you like it did many people. Yeah, I've always I've said many times that I'm a straight up MTV kid. And uh, yeah. it was right when it started, it blew me away and, and millions of others. But I was just, you know, it was by the clock, man. You know, 120 minutes, headbangers ball. Everything was incredible. Mind blowing. Yeah. 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 Hushed and Grim, the new double album from Macedon is out on October 29th. One of the other things about this record that we talked about, Troy, is your your late manager, Nick John, who was a dear friend of mine. And we were talking about this when we saw each other the other day, uh, how much we miss him. But in a, in a way, this record really, there's a big imprint from him on here as well. Can you talk a little bit about that? Yeah, it's, I would say it's a huge imprint. And um, it's, um, you know, I'm, I, I think when I go, now that it's, it's been recorded, mixed and mastered, and I've been listening to it nonstop for six plus months, you know, in its final form, it's almost, I, I realize that it's almost um, like, like, my, like a diary journal that I've, that I've got to express. And I kind of closed the book. Now I'm about to reopen it. Um, it's that personal, but it, it's it's got a it's got a a sweet ending um, as far as the creative process goes. But this is all about Nick. There's no way we couldn't write a, an album about him and what we've gone through. And I always called Nick John my best buddy before I called him our band's manager of of 15 plus years because our relationship was like that. Um, I hope this this is it, I, I'm I'm almost positive this will be a beautiful memorial uh, to Nick and for Nick. And a lot of these songs lyrically were penned as a conversation to him. Um, it is all it is all immersed in, in the spirit of Nick John, this whole record. And um, 
listening to it, I, I hope people will, will realize that it's not all doom and gloom. There's a lot of emotion in there. There's lots of layers of, of, um, of musicality and songwriting. It's not a, a, a double album of Mastodon Barrage, like our early material. If, if, if it was gonna be that brutal and heavy, we wouldn't have done a double album because that, that just wouldn't be fun to listen to. Um, but this is ultimately set up as a, as a beautiful, ornate, you know, musical memorial to and for Nick. And, um, and uh, we went through all the, me personally, I went through every stage of grief during this writing process. And, um, and the very final one was like this acceptance where, where all my anger and hatred and frustration it eventually, thankfully turned into, a, into joy, um, realizing that I'm a much greater person for having him in my life and knowing him and everything that he brought to me and for me and for us is that uh, I was touched by this incredible human being. So I'm so thankful that, uh, that the, I finally got to a feeling where I actually smiled um, after all the anger and the, and the tears and the just, just mad, you know, it's at this, this evil disease that takes some beautiful people. Um, so I'm, I'm glad to be able to talk to you about this today and just be like, Hey, this person just swooped us up, took us under his wings and our band became this wonderful thing that we're still continuing to do. Um, and personally, um, just changed me completely for the better. And uh, everything he, he, he brought into my life, uh, I'm, if I could just share any of that to other people, make them happy, make them listen, put a smile on their face, anything with a positive twist. Uh, that's just like, I feel like that's my life's duty <laughs> in a way. Yeah. So, yeah. yeah. That's beautiful, man. For people that don't know, uh, because it's more of an industry thing, but Nick was Mastodon's manager. And as Troy just said, friend and a friend of mine as well, and a regular listener of this show, and just one of the greatest dudes. And we, I talked a lot about him on the air when he passed away, he, he uh, passed away due to pancreatic cancer and, you know, fought very bravely, but quietly. It was a big shock when it happened to me because we just didn't know what was going on, but he was a wonderful human being and a guy that was a big champion, obviously, as you know, Troy, for your band and would always tell me about it, but in a way that was never pushy or never off-putting or just, you know, you got some people just great on you about stuff, but just, just the best guy. So I think it's wonderful that you paid tribute to him when he passed and, that this record has such a big, um, a big stamp of him on there. Tell me a little bit about pushing the tides, the, uh, the lead single and the video for it, which I thought was real interesting. Tell me a little bit about it. Well, um, it felt like a good of the 15 tracks that felt like a good one to put out there first. Cause it's, you know, kind of the old spirit of Mastodon where it's more of a, up, you know, a, a, more of a banger and um, it's short and sweet. And it's nice to, to have a three and a half minute song as, as well as the eight and nine minute Epic ventures, but that just felt like a good one to put out first. Um, it's a riff that our guitar player, Bill brought into the studio a year and a half ago, banged it out. Um, we just love the energy that it has. It's, it's one of the more, you know, easier to chew Mastodon songs. If you were to, to hear that for the, uh, never heard of our band to be like, Oh, okay, I get it. Um, but it's just one piece of the, uh, you know, of the 15 piece puzzle that does make the hushed and grim record. Um, lyrically it's, it's, uh, you know, every al every song on the record has, you know, has an underlying underlying theme to it. Uh, pushing the tides is just, uh, you know, overcoming. And um, it's just one step about it. Uh, I live on the beach. And uh, when it gets rough, you know, those tides and the waves, they push me around. And um, and uh, if you're weak and you're and you're and you're not feeling it or going down a, a, a dark negative hole, those tides can just take you under. And um and uh, you have to know whether to fight or just remove yourself from the situation. Um, so loosely put, Pushing the Tides has a theme of, uh, of just overcoming um, and uh, without getting too deep into to, to that song lyrically or every other one. But um, yeah, man, that's just one of many on the record. And uh, I like it. Tell me it's, about making the video. Uh, the video was cool. We did it in Atlanta a few weeks ago. And the past handful of, I couldn't tell you the last time we were in one of our own music videos. It's probably been five years. So this go around, we were like, you know what, let's be in some videos. Um, it's cool to have people making a video for your band when you're on tour and you don't have to meet up and, you know, run through it. And, um, but right. this record, uh, the four of us collectively, you know, we're just really connected and on fire and we want to be seen as a band in our videos again. And the song has a good upbeat energy. So we just got doused with water went into a warehouse and jammed you know the, the 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 treatment of us jamming in a warehouse is no different than thousands of other videos you'll see but uh our director lorenzo 
uh, he went to Italy and, um, and shot this really cool footage through this maze that exists in Sicily. Um, so it kind of looks like a, a, a set or some CGI um, cinematography on this video, but um, it, he, he came to Atlanta and shot us and then went to Sicily and did this other cool stuff. And uh, it's a very entertaining song and, and it's a banger of a tune. I'm happy with it. Yeah. Yeah. It's killer. It really is. Uh, the album is out on October 29th, Hushed and Grim. You can pre-order it now. A double studio record coming from Mastodon, uh, pushing the tides, the video. And of course the single is out now. Uh, Troy, I don't have a ton of time today, but before we, we go, let me ask you this live shows we started off talking about one that you did unexpectedly a couple weeks ago with rocklahoma obviously we're st we're in a weird middle phase now between where, where where things are with the pandemic some people are ready to go some people are only going to do scattered stuff what's the projection for you guys as far as live shows is concerned what are you thinking yeah uh, besides the uh aftershock sacramento festival in october uh we're gonna go do the metallica night at um at the uh, daytona Welcome to Rockville in November. And then the day after that, we're going to start a three week US tour, um, co, -headlining, co headlining with OPEF. Um, you don't get to a lot of cities in three weeks, but we're doing three weeks across the states in November, December. And then we'll pick back up and do more in the spring. We're just taking it in these short spurts. But um, yeah, it's, it's, you know, it's been announced and we're ready to rock. I hope, uh, you know, people want to come see shows, those that don't feel comfortable now. I totally understand. But uh, yeah, we just announced a, a, a U.S. tour a couple of days ago. I'm thrilled. I just hope that nothing uh, takes us, you know, a few steps back as a whole and uh, things continue to prove. And, and the past few shows, those festivals that we played and saw you at, Eddie, was just it was such a relief to uh, connect with people and, and just play the guitar in front of lots of people and have people smiling back and singing back. And uh, it's a damn good feeling. Yeah, yeah, it's great to see just even as a fan, it's just great to see that happening again and it's good to see it happening you know I, I come on the air here every day and for over a year i was talking about things not happening and it's great to be talking about things that are happening and you tour with opeth and stuff even if it's in small doses it seems like everyone's taking smaller chunks than the big commitment to three months or something two weeks three weeks just kind of testing the waters don't get too overextended we don't know what the future holds but hopefully we continue to make strides that's where everybody wants to go of course i believe so yeah yeah Listen, man, it's great to visit with you for a few minutes. Maybe we'll do more when the album actually comes out because we're over a month out from it being released, but it is coming out on October 29th, Hushed and Grim. And like I said, the single is out now. Good to talk to you for, for a few, man. And I've had the luxury here in the full record. I can tell my audience it is killer. Spend some time with it. It really, really seeps in. And it's, a, it's an amazing piece of work. So congrats. Awesome. Thank you, Eddie.
Give me.